Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We turn now to look at the political and economic crisis in Venezuela, where nearly 90 people have died and more than 1,500 have been injured since April, when opposition groups began organizing a new round of street demonstrations. Venezuelan President Nicolás Maduro has accused his opponents of waging a, quote, armed insurrection and economic sabotage backed by the United States. Uh, opposition groups have accused Maduro of turning into a dictator. The recent round of street protests began after the Venezuelan Supreme Court stripped the opposition-led National Assembly of its legislative power. The protests come as Venezuela's economic crisis keeps worsening, with, as the country suffers from high inflation and food shortages. Last week, Pope Francis appealed for a peaceful and democratic solution to the crisis in Venezuela. Cari fratelli e sorelle, il 5 luglio, dear brothers and sisters, Venezuela's Independence Day will be marked on July 5th. I would like to assure this beloved nation that they are in my prayers and express my closeness to the families who have lost their children in the demonstrations out on the streets. I appeal for an end to the violence and a peaceful and democratic solution to the crisis. May Our Lady of Coromoto intercede for Venezuela. And let us pray for Our Lady of Coromoto for Venezuela. The Pope is the first Latin American Pope. He's originally from Argentina. Well, over the past few weeks, a number of dramatic events have occurred in Venezuela. On June 28, a Venezuelan police officer hijacked a helicopter and dropped grenades on the Interior Ministry and the Supreme Court. Then, on July 5th, a crowd of about 100 people, reportedly supporters of Maduro, stormed the opposition-led National Assembly and attacked lawmakers. Meanwhile, on Saturday, Venezuela's most prominent opposition leader, Leopoldo López, was released from military prison and put under house arrest. To talk more about the situation in Venezuela, we're joined by two guests. In Washington, D.C., Mark Weisbrot is with us, co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research and president of Just Foreign Policy. Joining us from Chicago, Daniel Landsberg-Rodriguez. He's a columnist for the Venezuelan newspaper. El Nacional and an adjunct lecturer of finance at Northwestern's Kellogg School of Management. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Let's go to Daniel Landsberg Rodriguez in Chicago. Your assessment of what's happening in Venezuela right now? Uh, well, first of all, thank you for uh, having me on the show. It's a really important topic uh, to be discussing uh, in, in such a forum. Venezuela is really reaching uh, probably uh, the worst situation that it has had in living memory. Uh, there isn't enough food. Uh, there's uh, just gross, uh, harrowing scarcities of medicine. Uh, and this is something that has been building up for a long time. Uh, for many years, uh, the government uh, has focused on uh, large electoral spending binges uh, that, despite the largest oil windfall in human history, have left Venezuela essentially broke uh, and struggling to be able to both uh, keep imports at levels that allow their populations to have basic goods, given that they've done really nothing to stimulate uh, domestic production of any of these uh, staples. Uh, while at the same time making foreign debt payments because of the uh, indebtedure binge uh, that the government went through. Uh, so right now, you have a government that is what I would call an unpopular populist government. Its rhetoric is very populist, uh, but uh, Maduro's approval rating languishes uh, just below uh, 20 percent. Uh, there was uh, an electoral—in uh, 2015, the opposition won an electoral supermajority uh, in the legislature. Uh, this uh, new legislature has not been allowed to pass any laws because they're all struck down by uh, the Supreme Court as unconstitutional. This is a Supreme Court that was freshly packed by uh, Maduro himself uh, or by his pliant National Assembly right before the new National Assembly took office. Uh, and then governorship elections, which were slated for last year, have still not been taking have still not taken place. Uh, the government, uh, despite a, talking a good line about democracy, uh, is now afraid of the electorate, and that's something that creates a uh, a, a, a sense of conflict in which, uh, even though the vast majority of Venezuelans feel that a different future will be better. 
uh, have given up on uh, the current regime as their leadership. Uh, there is really no uh, democratic process in which they can, uh, you know, move forward in that way. Well, uh, Mark Weisbrot, I'd like to ask you your your assessment. Clearly, Maduro succeeded uh, President Hugo Chavez, who, despite uh, much criticism of him, clearly enjoyed uh, much more popularity uh, among the Venezuelan people. Your sense of what's been happening uh, in Venezuela the past couple of years? Well, I think a lot of what your other guest said is is true. I mean, in terms of the overall situation, I mean, I could add to it. I mean, inflation is over 500 percent, and you have scarcities of uh, food and medicine, and uh, the economy is in a very deep recession. And we could talk about that uh, if we have time. But I think most importantly. Uh, going forward, it's very important to avoid a civil war, an escalating conflict there. And that's why I'm very glad that you showed the Pope, uh, the Pope's call for uh, dialogue and uh, a democratic solution, because that was not reported anywhere in the international, major international media uh, a week or so ago when he said it. And I think that's the most important thing going forward. And I think that, for example, the release of Leopoldo Lopez, who was in jail for three years, that happened just a couple of days ago through honest mediation. That was the former prime minister Zapatero from Spain, who was mediating there. And it's very important to distinguish that from what's going on in the Organization of American States, which is just an attempt by the United States and its allies to use the organization to delegitimize the Venezuelan government so that it can be overthrown, something they've been trying to do uh, for the last 15 years. And regime change is not going to—is uh, is not a solution there, and everyone should recognize that. Uh, it's, you know, th there's over 100,000 uh, people in the military there. There's hundreds of thousands of people in militias. And, and, and a lot more people than that are armed. You, you really do have a danger of a, a civil war. And you have the Trump administration and Marco Rubio, who he seems to be listening to for advice on this. They want regime change. They're, that's their playbook. And if and, and so if this mediation, which is a very you know there's been a very hopeful sign now in the last few days, were to go forward, they're going to is a, a very uh, big danger that they could uh, sabotage that. And they could help uh, push the country more towards civil war. So this is very important, you know. And it's all political. Like in 2014, the uh, uh, Obama administration went to the OS and tried to get a uh, to intervene against Venezuela, and the whole assembly uh, reacted with a resolution supporting Maduro because uh, they were against regime change. 29 to 3 was the vote. Now you have right-wing governments in Brazil and Argentina, not just right-wing, but governments going to do whatever the Trump administration tells them on, on foreign policy. And so the OAS has become this instrument of regime change. And that's very dangerous, because the media, of course, uh, mostly reports it as though, uh, you know, this is—they uh, just care about human rights. And, you know, Marco Rubio openly threatened the governments of the Dominican Republic and Haiti and El Salvador, if they, that they would be punished if they didn't vote uh, with the U.S., uh, you know, against Venezuela. So I think that's the greatest danger going forward, is that this really could escalate. You know, you remember the civil wars of the 1980s in Central America. Hundreds of thousands of people were killed. You just had, uh, you know, 50 years of uh, a civil war in Colombia, which is coming to an end now through the agreement from last year. This could really get a uh, spin out of control, and it's very important. The most uh, well, important Mark, thing I'd is like to, to avoid follow that. that point up, if I can, uh, with uh, with uh, Daniel Landsberg Rodriguez. The issue of the polarization of Venezuelan society, and especially of the role of the military, because if it's one thing that Hugo Chavez did leave uh, uh, in a, as a legacy, it was as a military that pretty much defended 
ended the Bolivarian Revolution. I'm thinking, for example, of the Minister of Defense, of Vladimir Padrino, who's a, who is a firm chavista, so that the military, in this case, even if the Maduro government continues to lose support, seems that it would be solidly behind the Bol Bolivarian Revolution and could lead to a potential uh, civil war or much, much more violent situation unless some kind of negotiations are reached. I'm wondering your thoughts on that. Well, uh, that's the uh, one million Bolivar question, which uh, would be about uh, two hundred dollars uh, at the current exchange rate. Uh, they ex essentially, actually, before I answer that, there's a couple of corrections I want to make on uh, what uh, on, on, on on Mark's uh, discussion. Uh, he said Leopoldo Lo the release of Leopoldo Lopez. Leopoldo Lopez has not been released. Uh, he is still serving out his 14-year sentence. Uh, but he's doing it under house arrest. Uh, the Supreme Court ostensibly let him out for health reasons uh, and because of some uh, sort of uh, a, a unusual aspects of the evidentiary uh, findings against him. This was the Supreme Court's criminal wing, uh, which tends to be a little bit uh, less stolidly pro-Maduro than the constitutional chamber, uh, which is the one that has struck down all the, uh, all the laws uh, that the legislature has tried to pass. Uh, and also, uh, returning to the pope, there's, this is not the first time the pope has made such a call. I think one of the reasons the international media may not have put as much attention on it is because this is the third or fourth time the pope has made a call for peace in Venezuela. Uh, and one of those times, the opposition actually engaged in dialogue with Maduro uh, and with the current regime, and that led to uh, the people leaving the streets. Uh, they sat down, and no concessions were made. Uh, nothing was agreed upon. Uh, so you can't look at uh, the opposition's, uh, let's call it, uh, insecurities about re-engaging with Maduro in a vacuum. Uh, this is something that is, has been learned uh, through multiple attempts up to this point, some of which have involved the Vatican already. As for the military, uh, the military in Venezuela has traditionally been uh, a, a, a strong uh, social group uh, in uh, national decision making. Venezuela has not had a war against one of its neighbors since independence. Uh, it has not had a civil war since the 19th century. The military traditionally in Venezuela was uh, very community oriented. Uh, and uh, when in 1989 uh, you had riots, the Caracaso, uh, there were there was a massacre uh, that was ordered by a former uh, government against rioters, uh, which really hurt the military's credibility. And in that sense, Chavez, who uh, attempted afterwards to overthrow that president uh, and in, in February of 1992, and then his supporters did so again a, in a coup attempt that killed hundreds of people uh, in uh, November of that year, uh, that was something that created a bond uh, between Hugo Chavez personally and the military that I would say transcended just the fact that he came from them. Uh, the system that Maduro inherited is one that was very much designed to run and be fueled by Chavez. It's a system that promises a lot, delivers much less, and that gulf was something that could be made up for in personal charisma and in uh, just lavish oil rents, uh, none of which apply on, in this new government under uh, Maduro. Uh, so the military's personal loyalty to Maduro is much weaker than it ever was under Hugo Chavez. The reason I would think that the military has taken less of an active role throughout this crisis has to do with two factors. One, during the largest oil windfall in human history, which has essentially disappeared, uh, there was a lot of corruption. Uh, and much of that, uh, much of the smuggling went to people who guarded the border. Uh, there's important narco-trafficking uh, that has gone on through Venezuela, largely through the Air Force and the Naval Forces. So there's a lot of the military brass who may not personally like Maduro or think that he's doing a good job, but the fear of a transition that might investigate what happened to that oil windfall, which has now disappeared, uh, is something that keeps, uh, makes people prefer the devil they know in a certain, uh, to a certain extent. Uh, that said, while we're not seeing any sort of organized insurrection within the military at a large scale, we are seeing a, a huge amount of defections. We've had hundreds of military defectors uh, who have basically just walked off at this point. Uh, the read that I am sensing from the military right now is that unlike in the 2002 coup attempt, uh, 
uh, against Hugo Chavez where the military reinstated him. I don't think we would see that this time. I don't think the military will take an active role in uh, toppling Maduro, and I don't think it should. Uh, but if there were to be, for example, a palace coup within Chavismo, I have serious doubts that the military would rally to defend him the way they once did for Chavez. Mark Weisbrot, uh, your response that to strong. that. Let's get Mark Weisbrot's response to that. Well, I think there's, you know, Daniel is right that um, there's a fear, not just in the military, but anybody who's a Chavista uh, associated with, or anyone associated with the government, what would happen if a right-wing government were to come to power during uh, a military coup, like they did in 2002. And within the 36 hours that they were in power, dozens of people were killed, and there was a roundup of government officials that had been begun. And this is, you know, the opposition does not have a democratic history in the last 15 years in Venezuela, not only the military coup, but they repeatedly rejected uh, results of democratic elections and went to the streets and tried to overturn them. And uh, so there is a, a threat. There's a lot of people who are afraid of what would happen to them, and not just military, but ordinary people, people associated with the government, I, I if wanna, they come I to power turn, in a coup. I want to turn to President Trump speaking in May about Venezuela. Venezuela is a very, very serious problem. We haven't really seen a problem like that, I would say, Mr. President, in decades, in terms of the kind of violence that we're witnessing. Uh, the president was telling me, and I knew, that Venezuela was a very, very wealthy country, just about the wealthiest in your neck of the woods, and uh, had tremendous strengths in so many different ways. And now it's, uh, it's poverty-stricken. People don't have enough to eat. People have no food. There's great violence. And we will do whatever is necessary, and we'll work together to do whatever is necessary to help with fixing that. And I'm really talking on a uh, humanitarian level. When you That was President Trump uh, speaking in a joint news conference with the Colombian President Sanchez. Well, Venezuelan President uh, Nicolas Maduro recently warned President Trump not to repeat the mistakes of his predecessors. President Donald Trump, busque un poco de racionalidad en las locuras que impulsa. President Donald Trump. Try to have some rationality in the crazy things that your people promote against Venezuela. What the opposition has done is to trick you. Let's talk seriously. And where we have our differences, we have differences. But there are many points in common, including your administration, Donald Trump, in terms of overcoming dark times. May you, President Donald Trump, not be remembered as another failure, like George Bush and Barack Obama failed. So, very quickly, um, the response to Maduro and, before that, Trump speaking alongside uh, the Colombian President Santos, Daniel Lunsberg Rodriguez. So, I think that uh, Trump's interest levels in Venezuela are actually quite low. Uh, the reason that he uh, has brought that focus, I would say, in uh, talks with President Santos in Colombia that you cited, and before that, uh, a couple months earlier, with one of his first world meetings uh, with uh, the president of Peru, uh, uh, President uh, Kaczynski, that was... It's difficult for Trump, given some of the rhetoric that has gone on vis-a-vis uh, -vis Mexico. Uh, which alienated not just Mexicans, but many Latin American countries. Uh, and in Peru and Colombia in particular, these are countries that have—I believe Peru has more free trade agreements than any other country. Colombia is not far behind. Uh, and so it's very difficult for the Trump administration to find common ground internationally in Latin America. And Talking let me get Mark Weisbrot's response as we wrap which up. Which is, is one way to Daniel, do Daniel, let me get Mark's response as we wrap sure. up. Sure. Yes, well, I think that, again, the most important thing is that it's still a polarized country. You know, Daniel mentioned the 21 percent approval rating. That's about where it's been for a year. I mean, imagine people saying that the president is doing a good job when there's 500 percent inflation and deep uh, depression and, and shortages of food and medicine. Why is that? Again, it's because there's a lot of people who still, uh, you know, for, first of all, there's millions of people who actually appreciate what the, the 10 years of progress that they had uh, 
under Chavez. Uh, secondly, they're afraid of what might happen to them if a Venezuela, if a right-wing government takes power in a coup. And so, uh, you know, that's why it's so important to have negotiations. That's why you need constitutional guarantees. Uh, who, whoever loses the next uh, presidential election doesn't face a government that controls all three branches of government and uses it to persecute them. I think those are the like things that one. are going to have to happen. We have going to leave forward. it there. I want to thank you both for being with us. Um, Daniel Landsberg Rodriguez speaking to us from North uh, from Chicago at Northwestern's Kellogg School of Management and Mark Weisbrot Center for Economic and Policy Research in D.C. That does it for our show. Very happy birthday to Laura Gottesdiener. Democracy Now! is produced by Mike Burke, Dina Guzder, Nermeen Sheikh, Carla Wills, Laura Gottesdiener, Sam Alkoff. I'm Amy Goodman.